Hello everyone and welcome to another News Coulomb video and um, another plug side chat. And it's been a long time since I've done one of these and I, I really need to get back into it. You want to call it a New Year's resolution, fine, call it a New Year's resolution. But um, yeah, 2023 uh, for me is going to be, <laughs> I, I you know, it's the year of eating elephants really. I have so many big projects that can't be completed in just a single sitting that I'm having to just eat an elephant, right? Do a, a bite-sized chunk at a time. So uh, expect a lot more sort of small bite updates about things like the Ford Ranger electric project, uh, some trips and things like that that I'm doing. Um, but also in terms of these plug side chats, because there's so much to talk about in the EV industry right now. There's so much to talk about in the public charging uh, industries right now that there's just no way to do it short of this. And I, you know, this is like really like my third full-time job. There's been a lot of stuff that's been already happening um, this year. Not, not all of it good news. I've literally driven to San Francisco three or four times in the last week, which is a 300, 350 mile round trip for me. So these plug side chats, for those of you who aren't familiar, they're, they're really just more of an op-ed short, uh, not like thoroughly researched. It's really just my opinions and editorializing based on data that I have, information that I have. So uh, it's more, really more of a discussion. And those of you who've interacted with me know that I'm not necessarily set in a lot of my beliefs and opinions. I have a reason for them. They're based. Um, but they're also open for updates as new information comes available. Uh, and the first one I really wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, Kyle Connor out of spec. If you haven't followed his channel already, um, you probably should. He's, he's done a lot of great coverage. Uh, I consider him at this point, one of the better, uh, uh, public charging infrastructure, uh, channels in terms of covering what's going on. Uh, also Steve on plug and play EV, you know, he has a very good view of what's going on on the East coast as well. And so Kyle though, he recently did an interview with Arcady, uh, the CEO and founder of Freewire. Now I've probably used Freewire chargers as much as anyone. I've probably used as many different Freewire char uh, charging sites as anyone. Uh, they started to be sort of littered around California and I've been to a number of them uh, I really like the concept of them and the fact that they're offering high power charging. Uh, their boost chargers uh, can hook up to very low input power, but provide 150 kilowatt charging. That's great. Now, I mean, there are pluses and minuses to that. That integrated 160 kilowatt hour battery pack adds a huge cost to the charger, uh, making it, you're, you're basically paying up front for a, a charger that's lower uh, cost to operate over time. Um, but something that Arcady had mentioned, and I feel like it deserves a larger conversation. So when he was talking with Kyle, he mentioned that their business model is to install a single free wire boost charger at a site and then use that as the business case for that site host to expand, right? And the problem I have with that is you're not getting the information that you want because I think in a lot of public charging providers' minds, I think there's a disconnect. And essentially, good prime location is synonymous with a high demand charging site. And that's not actually true. So a good example of this is I think site for site EVGO's site placements are way better than Tesla's. Like it's not even close in terms of on-site amenities, in terms of where they're located on routes, things like that. Overall, uh, EVGO's sites are better located than Tesla's superchargers. But who would argue that EVGO's sites are a more compelling high demand location than Tesla's? And so you have to think about that. So if the, if the location 
isn't what's creating the demand for a site, what is actually making that site compelling for EV owners? And so installing a single charger, like a single free wire charger, even if it's a split power charger at a location, is not going to give you a good idea of just how high the demand is for that location. Uh, and examples I can point to, there's a TA travel stop up here uh, in Corning in Northern California that has a single free wire charging site. It's just off of I-5. It should be an extremely high demand site, but I guarantee you that it's not. And the reason for that is why are you going to exit a freeway, drive you know, four or five minutes to get to a charger that might be occupied or broken. And we can get into FreeWire's reliability later because I haven't personally found them to be the most reliable chargers. And so if you have a down plug, an occupied plug, uh, a single charging site, that's a huge risk for anyone to exit a freeway and go to that site when there are multi-charger sites to the north and to the south on the same freeway. And so one component of building a, you know, a compelling high demand site is you have to put in the work first, right? You actually have to make the site compelling enough that it drives the demand that you would like to see. And this is, a, this is an issue that a lot of these public charging providers still haven't wrapped their heads around. And it's one of the reasons that I do the site reviews that I do and why they're so complex and in many ways fluid, right? So location is one aspect of what I grade these charging sites on in terms of how compelling they are. But that's, again, a fluid sort of grading cycle. It, it can shift and ebb and flow based on, you know, where that location is relative to other charging sites um, and the number of electric vehicle owners it might be supporting, are there alternative routes, that sort of thing. So the location importance in my overall site score, uh, it, it's already fluid, but it's only 20% of the score. Right, so what's that other eighty percent? And it and it goes down to things like what amenities are on site, how safe and secure is the site. That all feeds into that sort of amenities as well, right? Are the are the are the sites covered? Do are they well lit? Are they safe? Are there things to do with your time when you're there? Because fueling a gas car on the road is a fundamentally different experience than fueling an EV. Gas car, it's a discrete event. You don't do anything else when you're standing in front of a gas pump pumping gas. With an EV, it's completely different. You plug in, you walk away. Now, I'm seeing more and more EV owners who are staying with their cars for the 10, 15, 20, 30 minute sessions, maybe playing video games in their computer on their car. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. That's kind of a foreign concept to me because when I think of my trips, I think... I have a stop, what do I need to do, right? And so I try to build my EV trips around me as a driver and my passenger's needs, not the car's needs. And so I look for the amenities to be on site that allow me to do that. Do they, do I, can I use the bathroom? Is there a safe, clean bathroom to use? Or is there food on site? I need to grab something to drink. I forgot to pack something. I needed to, to grab something from a store. I'm going camping, that sort of thing. I get supplies, right? Uh, or, you know, I'm coming home and I haven't had a chance to go shopping, so I go to the grocery store. Those are the types of things that I do with my time when I'm charging because otherwise I'm wasting time, right? Otherwise I might as well have a gas car and spend the 5 to 10 to 15 minutes doing nothing but fueling it. And so... That's one aspect of it. Those amenities are one aspect of it. Another aspect is access, right? And part of that access does come down to how many plugs are available. So when FreeWire says, oh, we install a single charger uh, that's split power, sure, you, in theory, can be charging two EVs at once. But 
FreeWire needs to start looking at uh, releasing their boost configurations with two CCS charging heads as well. And that's probably, in my opinion, maybe the best baseline site that FreeWire could produce in terms of actually getting a good gauge on the demand for a site would be something like a two-unit uh, shared power FreeWire boost with a single Chatamo head on one charger and then two CCS heads on another charger, giving you the, the at least the potential to be charging four EVs concurrently, three of them CCS, one of them uh, Chatamo. And then maybe lowering the cost by using smaller batteries or, or however they can do that to balance it all out. Uh, but I would say at a minimum, we shouldn't see any charging sites going in at this point that don't have at least four active posts or heads at a single time. And that's a sort of a baseline uh, entry level uh, compelling site that we, we need to see moving forward. And then of course there are other things about making the speeds appropriate for the stop. You could argue that at this point, for a convenient store location where a lot of these free wires are going in, maybe 150 kilowatt is no longer fast enough. Maybe it really does need to be a 200, 250, 300 kilowatt in order to make that speed compelling enough to match that site requirement, right? Or that that site need. Not sure there are some efficient EVs that even on a 150 kilowatt charger would make use of a 10 to 15 to 20 minute convenience store stop, but a lot can't, right? So matching those speeds to the site. And then of course, all of the, the other factors that I said tied into making it compelling. So it's no longer an issue of, oh, we put a charger here. Uh, this will let us gauge how, how compelling the site is. Things don't work that way anymore. You, you actually... You can fill in some gaps, right? Maybe in rural areas where you weren't expecting there to be demand. Um, but if you're going in blind too, spending that much on a DC fast charger like a free wire boost charger just to gauge demand is also, in my opinion, a little bit suspect. So I, I think we need to have, you know, a, a real discussion about uh, site layouts, right? Is it pull through parking? Um, are we actually providing enough stalls for each of the active heads? I know EVgo is struggling with this right now where they're putting in their Delta City chargers, which split power. Granted, they're only 200 amps. So if you're splitting power, two cars are only charging at 30 kilowatt. Um, but they're installing them so that only one parking stall can reach that charger. So you have two active heads, but you only have one parking space. And that's also not a good use uh, of space. And then again, like I said, if you're not supporting things like uh, longer format EVs pulling trailers, that's a problem. And then again, if your uh, overall power doesn't match the needs of the site, you know, maybe 50 kilowatt is perfectly reasonable for a city parking garage uh, or a city center where people are going to spend one, two hours, but uh, you would want something like 100 kilowatt for a sit down restaurant or a grocery store, whereas you demand 150 or faster for a convenience store stop, a freeway stop. Um, maybe 150 is a sort of standard for a fast food restaurant. Um, but so all of these factors, you know, come into it, your, your amenities, access, the number of charging posts per, per site, the speed of those chargers relative to the use case of the business, and then obviously also location. So all of those factors combined are really uh, what, what d decides whether a site is compelling or not. And though I don't grade for it, in my reviews specifically, it is something that's always on my mind and people comment on it a lot is the reliability. The reason I don't report on it is because I want my site reviews to be evergreen, right? Uh, so if, if a charging provider is having issues with the reliability, I don't want that to be a permanent black mark on a site review that I might not be able to revisit. I want my site reviews to focus on the things that aren't likely to change 
instead of things like reliability, where it, it could easily just be fixing a cable and then all of a sudden the site is 100% perfect. But reliability does also factor into that um, in terms of uh, making a site compelling. So again, not to pick on FreeWire, but that's something that they need to work on. They need to make sure that in addition to all of those other factors that I named, if they want to have a good, true understanding of how compelling a site is and the demand that they should be seeing on that site, they also need to make sure that people feel like those free wire chargers are reliable, something that they can go and access on a trip uh, and not have to worry about whether the plug is going to be working, uh, whether they're even going to be able to access the plug. I've had that happen too. I mean, the charger was down, but because of the format and the way it's laid out, there was a gas car parked in front of the CCS plug and there was no way for that CCS cable to reach my Chevrolet Bolt EV with the CCS uh, plug on the driver's side front. So uh, these are factors that they need to consider. Reliability and access to the chargers are really important also in determining uh, how much demand that, that site is going to see. And the more chargers you build, just as a sort of general rule, the more demand you're going to see. So if FreeWire does start installing two chargers instead of just one at a base level, they're more likely to provide a better business case for their clients than they are if they're trying to install one and see how many people they can get. Because they also don't know how many people arrived, saw a busy charger, and then left. Right. So that's that's sort of a missed opportunity that they have no way of tracking, not through data or anything else. So um, anyway, I went quite long on this, but I, I feel like it's an important topic in terms of I think these public charging providers need to understand that a lot more goes into deciding whether a site is going to be a high demand site or a lot more goes into creating a high demand site or a compelling site than just putting a plug in the ground and then hoping for the best. So I, I hope this was interesting. I hope it was useful. Uh, let me know what you think about these sort of discussions, because like I said, I, they're not necessarily well researched. They're just sort of my opinion. There's something that I like to discuss, open a dialogue on, hopefully the charging providers look at it as well. Um, because I think it's, it's, we're getting to the point where it's not good enough to just put a plug in the ground. Uh, you're wasting a lot of resources and you're wasting a lot of time. There needs to, to be sort of a baseline level of compelling that the site reaches uh, in order for you, be, you know, before you should even break ground. So um, let me know what you think. Uh, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments below. If you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe. It really helps out the channel and, uh, Thank you for watching.